You are listening to WKVT 100.3 FM and 1490 AM. We have interrupted our regular programming to bring you A Call to Action, a public forum that focuses on critical issues facing the greater Brattleboro area. Today's topic is mental health. My name is Chris Lenoir, and I'm joined by my WKVT colleague, Fish, to moderate this conversation, along with a panel of guests to talk about the mental health-related challenges facing our community on a number of levels, and hopefully shed light on available resources. We are broadcasting live in the meeting room at Brooks Memorial Library until 12 noon today. Members of the community are welcome to come in and listen, as well as participate in the discussion. This program is also being recorded by Brattleboro Community Television for later airing on their cable channels and the BrattleboroTV.org website. We thank BCTV and Brooks Memorial Library for partnering with us to bring you this forum, as well as Works Bakery for providing refreshments. Thank you. Among the many definitions that fall under the umbrella of mental health, a big part of what has been forced under the vastness of definitions are the individual individuals with developmental delays, people who require 24-hour a day, seven-day uh, seven a week care, people who can never really live independently, people whose lives are bounced around in foster care system style, system uh, with uh, Organizations like HCRS and Families First expected to keep up with the high demand while suffering cutback after cutback and having to wage battle in public forums, much like this one, just to fight for a simple 3% cost of living increase. My sister is one of those people that fall under this umbrella. Born profoundly brain damaged, my parents made sure she never hit the ground. She has had the good fortune of being on the positive side of this because she has strong advocates in my father. When my mother was alive, she was not afraid to pick up the phone and rattle some cages. And, of course, her brother, myself, who can put together, along with my coworker, a forum that can shine a light on what needs improvement for those who don't have a strong advocate. Our intentions are this, to bring forward problems in a system, how they impact everyone at every level, and with that, give us a clearer path to fixing these issues. With knowledge comes power. And today we are going to start much like we ended our last forum when we did one on opiates. And um, through talking with Chris, we had everybody share their stories at the end, which really stimulated a conversation and brought forth a lot of questions. So today we're going to start with that. Yes, and we have a lot of uh, people who are in the system here uh, who want to listen to a lot of these stories. And uh, again, this is an opportunity for people here in the audience to speak. But we have invited a couple of people to join us here at the table uh, and be part of a panel to help us get that conversation started. Uh, We have uh, both Gene Clough and Judy Seiler. Really appreciate you both joining us this morning. And uh, Gene, let me just ask you a little bit closer to the microphone there. And we'd we'd like you, if you wouldn't mind, to to get us started this morning. Thank you. As Chris said, I'm Jean Clough. I'm a resident of Brattleboro. Sorry. I am the single parent of three amazing children. One has a PhD and teaches geography. One is a puppeteer in Iceland. And one has schizophrenia. One out of every four families has a family member that is affected with some form of mental illness. Justin, my son, is intelligent and artistic, but he has faced different challenges in his life than his siblings. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 20, just when his adult life was beginning. He is now 36, and because of this illness, he was not afforded the same opportunities as his siblings. He was and will continue to face many challenges in his life. When he was 19, he came back home to live with me and had his, a major psychotic break. I was able to get him to HCRS to the walk-in clinic and the process began to get him stabilized and into recovery. I felt that he was able to get these services in a timely manner. Over the course of 13 years, he made great strides in his recovery. He was compliant in his treatment. He was never hospitalized. And I believe that this was due to the team that was working with him at HCRS and that I was able to provide a stable, safe environment for him. 
At one point, a critical team member at HCRS was moving on. And because my son had trust and rapport with this individual, we decided, or he decided, that he would follow this individual to the other agency. With that move, he lost the rest of the team that he had at HCRS. I feel that interagency cooperation is crucial. Where other agencies can work together to provide a cohesive care plan. In the late fall of 2012, my son stopped taking his meds. He lived with the stigma of his illness and he just wanted to be like everyone else. As a family, we have been in crisis to this very day. My son does not see that his thinking is distorted. And because he is an adult, there is very little that I can do to get him the medical help that he needs. It really is in his hands now. It's a trade-off between him being functional and dealing with the side effects of the different meds to be able to care for oneself to see your loved one lost within their delusions is devastating the symptoms of this lifelong illness is who he is now and I love him. I'm waiting for his light to shine again. When I will be able to be a part of his life. I have found that the mental health care system is different today than it was at the onset of his illness in 2000. There simply are not enough providers in our state of Vermont to meet the needs of individuals. Once you have left an agency or have missed appointments, it is practically impossible to get services. What have I done? Well, first of all, I cared for him for 13 years. When in crisis, I took him to the ER to be evaluated by the crisis team. I made calls to the crisis team. I called 911 and had to have the police remove him from my home. I even had to get a restraining order. I never imagined that I would have to do this. It's absolutely heartbreaking. The ER and the police are taking on more and more of the initial response. The ER becomes a holding place until a spot can be found at a psychiatric hospital. My son was held for six days in a small ER room until a place could be found for him and so that he could get the help that he needed. Since 2014, my son has had seven hospitalizations. Most were brief 72 hour where he was released with no support. One for 52 days in Troy, New York. At that point, I had my restraining order revised, allowed him to come home, and within a week, he was out of the house again and off to California and has been homeless. If only intervention could have happened before he was in crisis. I have always felt fortunate for the 13 years when, I took, when he took care of himself, but that accounts for nothing now. I have begged for help, literally begged. I struggle with the guilt 
on some of my decisions. I grieve for my son. And yes, I have even been frightened of him. But I still love him. There is a desperate need for change in the mental health care system. More funding is needed so that the demands can be met. Competitive wages to help eliminate staff turnover. Community supported housing where case managers can go to these individuals and make sure everything is okay. So that when someone misses their appointment, they can detect the early warning signs so that they don't lose their services. The focus on main it should be on maintaining recovery, not crisis intervention. More support, not less. I don't know what's gonna happen to my son. Right now he is at the retreat. Um, I don't know when he will be released. My hope is that he will be moved to a step down unit like Spring Ranch. There are not many of these and it is very difficult for an individual to get in there. Spring Ranch is a residential program where individuals continue to receive the support they need um, to live independently. If my son is released without this kind of support, he will be rehospitalized and the vicious cycle continues. Individuals like my son with severe and persistent mental illnesses do not always receive the appropriate follow-up care as someone with other illnesses like cancer, like a stroke, like a severe brain injury from an accident. For the last 16 years, I have learned to take life day by day moment by moment, because it can change that fast. I rejoice in the small things, like good morning, mom. I have gained strength to carry on by attending support groups and the NAMI, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, their family to family program. I have made friends with individuals that understand what I am going through and what my son is going through. For those that you are listening today, you do not have to be alone and isolated because we do become isolated when we're caring for our loved ones. There is help, there is hope. Sometimes that's all we have is hope. I thank you for inviting me here today to share the struggles and the challenges and the little bits of joy. And to discuss the needs for change in our mental health care system. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Jean, thank you for your courage in getting this conversation started with that really powerful story. Uh, I'd like to have us all digest the story you just gave us here. We'll take a, a short commercial break for the radio and then be back. We also have uh, Judy Seiler uh, from the National Alliance for Mentally Ill here locally, as well as her own personal story to tell and other people here in the audience. So we'll be back continuing our call to action forum on issues of mental health here on WKVT after these messages. Thank you for coming back to A Call to Action. Uh, we are discussing mental health today. Uh, we and just heard our first account uh, from Jean who had uh, quite the story to tell, and some of her frustrations uh, came through in that story, and we really do, once again, really appreciate you sharing uh, that with us, Gene. We know that that had to be difficult. It's a, it was, it's a long tale that's far from over. Um, but Gene's brought some support with her from the National Alliance of Mental Illness, uh, Judy Seiler, who also would like to speak. So, Judy, welcome to our forum, and uh, tell us a little bit about Na NAMI. NAMI? NAMI? Um, well, thank you for having me here today, and thank you so much for your story, Jean. Um, NAMI has given me uh, a second life. Um, I have a story that if we have time to go into, I'd like to share with you. But through our journey, um, we became isolated, we became alone, and um, 
that's one of the sad things. We say that um, you've got the illnesses that are the casserole illnesses. You know, you hear about a family member that's had has cancer or there's a traumatic brain injury. Um, we had a friend who had a, who had a terror was in a coma, and we think we had up to thirty thousand people praying for him. It was on Facebook. His mom had a blog, and everybody was there for her. Whereas when we have something, uh, mental illness strikes. It's often the person str ha that has the mental illness might say, please don't tell anybody. Please don't tell anybody I might be going to the hospital. Um, and people are afraid, they're frightened, they don't understand. And when you don't know how to help, just that is often frightening. And your friends tend to disappear. Your family uh, sometimes disappears. Part of a mental illness, unfortunately, is there's times when chaos seems normal to them. and Part of the, uh, the illness causes them to create strife and arguments and split the family. So then you have even more isolation. Some of the family members that you counted on to be supporters have also disappeared. And what does NAMI do? One of the things you find when you go to NAMI is you're not alone. I say NAMI takes you from anger and frustration to compassion and empathy. It takes you from isolation to participation. We have support groups. The support group in Brattleboro has been here over 30 years in the same place in West Brattleboro. Uh, it's at the con Congregational Church in West Brat the first Monday of every month at 6.30. Uh, we, I'm a trained facilitator. Uh, my husband and I are there. Um, we are able to provide support. We tell, you're there, you can come and tell your story, just as Jean did tonight, and then there's usually, we try to have some laughter, we try to have some fun, we try to come up, we have, if somebody is in crisis, you know, we try to focus, is there something we can do for you? And we have sometimes big meetings, sometimes small ones. And you, be, you develop friendships through it. Another thing that NAMI has, their signature program is called Family to Family. It's a 12 week class. We educate, we support, we give you ideas, of things to do in your own recovery. Many family members, with what we've been through, many of us suffer from post-traumatic stress and other depression or anxiety. We've been through a roller coaster of events. One of the things that we recommend in NAMI is RAP. Another thing that through NAMI, I've got to find out about and I'm also involved with, the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. When this was developed, it was sort of a weird idea to think about recovery. You took your meds, you were in the hospital, maybe you were at home, you were lucky if you weren't in crisis. Well, one of the things about NAMI is we talk about recovery for families, recovery for fi ill family members, and we recommend different tools and different things, and RAP completely complements that, because it's a whole program of wellness tools and how to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So through NAMI, I've gotten, developed a new life, I have new friends, I have new supporters, I have a whole family of wonderful people that understand and help me to have a good day every day and find the little joys in life. And then that's really what that's all about. When we discuss uh, mental illness, um, oftentimes there is a, there's a chemical resolve to it. They're called pharmaceuticals. And as long as a person is staying on their meds, we, you and me, are fine. How are they? Well, this is one of the things about today, uh, Mary Ellen Copeland that developed RAP, she had taken this as, you know, well, I just take my pill. You know, she didn't take personal responsibility for how can I maintain my wellness and my recovery. And this is one of the things that we talked about. We educate about medications in NAMI, but that's not the only answer. And that's what's unfortunate. You watch TV, you see the commercials, what do they say? Oh, if you just have this pill, everything's gonna be fine. Mary Ellen had a toxic reaction to her medication, didn't work anymore, and they said, oh, well, she wound up in the hospital, her life fell apart, and she said to the doctor, well, what are wellness tools I can use? And he was like, well, I don't really know. So she reached out into the world, into the community, came up with wellness tools, and, but it's really hard, and that's one reason it's so important to have a consistent team, people that get to know your family member. What works for them? Do they need a lot of exercise? You know, do they need to have a certain medicine that works for them as part of their plan? Do they need to eat the right things? Do they need to get rest? 
So it's very, very complicated, and everyone's different. You can't just go to the doctor and have a test and say, oh, you know, this is the infection you have. This is the antibiotic that's going to work for you. This is a, this is a pill that, w that will fix you. It's not yeah. like that. That's only a piece of the plan. I often have uh, often said about pharmaceuticals, at least when it comes to treating these kind of illnesses, that, that, that they help, they directly impact and help the person who's not affected by the illness and, and having to kind of tamp down the behavior so that we as a society can better deal with it. And it just doesn't matter that they feel like they're walking through rubber cement. Well, isn't that a perfect way of putting it? They tamp down the behavior. Because if you read the history of the development of many of our pharmaceuticals for mental health, they were accidentally discovered. They didn't say, here's the bacterium, and let's find something that will actually fight that, and they look at it under the microscope. They would be researching something and doing tests and find something that would really calm down the lab animals and say, oh boy, let's, let's try this. The FDA is not required to show a good outcome. They're only required to show a reduction in sim symptoms. So, you know, I, this is what's, I'm not, what I'm not, what's happening. I don't feel well. Oh, okay, well, we're going to fix that symptom. But, well, now I'm sitting here and, I, and I'm, I can't focus. Yeah, I'm calm and I'm not in crisis, but I'm going to go back to work. I, I want to take care of my family. And so the FDA is not required to show that you can have a productive life. So that's why we really have to use meds as just one piece of the plan. We really need to develop a whole wellness recovery plan for our lives, and we have to encourage our family members to do that. We need the same thing. You know, the doctor can say to you, oh, you're really stressed from everything you've been through with your family member. Um, I, I could give you something for anxiety. Well, no, I'm going to go for a walk with my golden retrievers. I'm going to get enough sunshine. You know, people say to me, oh, your dogs are so spoiled. No, my <laughs> dogs are taking care of me. You know, I go out when it's really cold. I go out in the snow, and it's snowing, and I come back feeling better. So it's, that's part of my wellness plan, and I need to be around people. Uh, you know, if I find myself getting isolated, and when your family member's ill, it can be very easy to get isolated. So I'm f so fortunate that through the programs I work with now, I've developed a whole new support group of friends. Excellent. Uh, Judy, I wanted to ask you, uh, can't help but notice you keep using we and I, and obviously you have your own personal story, as everybody in NAMI does. You were telling me off the air that that is one of the reasons you all uh, get together. Thinking about what Jean was talking about, uh, something that really struck me when she talked about how once somebody is outside the system, it's practically impossible to get back in. Is, is NAMI a place where sharing those stories of, of different people and, and their own situations can help people navigate ways to find their ways back to these services? Absolutely. That's one of the things we do in our support groups. And that's what we have a, in Vermont. We even have a one-day class, uh, mental health and recovery, uh, one-day class that we developed. And in our 12-week family-to-family family class, we have weeks that we talk about advocacy. That's the whole theme for the evening. We have weeks when we talk about wellness for the family members. We have nights when we talk about how do you communicate with your family member when they're not well. And we talk about the system. We have uh, NAMI for Vermont has a whole guidebook on where you can go, um, who can help advocate for you, what are our resources, what are our doctors, where our clinics are. We have, um, we definitely work with folks on that. And it can be very frustrating. Uh, you really have to advocate. We teach people to be calm to insist. We don't encourage people to call and rant and rave. We say, you know, we understand that the designated agencies are having a difficult time too. They don't have enough funding. They, it is not kept up with the needs in the state. Um, they don't, it's hard if they don't have um, competitive salaries for their employees, it's hard to have them. In our case, with, with, with my daughter, one of the things that triggered a very traumatic in incident, she has, she's adopted from Russia and has attachment disorder. She was able to bond with a wonderful person at HCRS, and they had to move on to another job. This actually was part of what triggered a suicide attempt for our daughter. So it's, it's, it's critical small things that the rest of us take for granted that can trigger these episodes. Um, we can find that in mental disorders. We can find that in folks that are developmentally delayed. Yes. Um, and I, I've often used this um, ex uh, example to, to explain how it must feel. If all, I'm sure everybody who's listening, everybody in this room has moved from one house to another and how disruptive 
that move can be, even when you go from point A to point B, and you have the capability of comprehending the move. You are making the conscious decision to move. People with mel mental illness who are developmentally delayed do not have that comprehension level. So if we are struggling with that, making a conscious decision, what must that feel like to somebody who doesn't have that decision, who isn't consciously making that decision, rather having that forced onto them and how disruptive that must be to them. So these changes that you talk about in staffing, and is it, is it because of cutbacks? Is it because you know they can just get a better paying job? Is it because they can just fry French fries at McDonald's and just hang their hat up at the end of the day and just sit down in front of the TV and not have to think about it? You know, the people who do the work that help these people, like yourselves, like the folks from Family First, HCRS, um, deeply care about it. But after a while, you sort of have to pull back and say, I, I need to care for myself, too. This is getting a little crazy. When workloads increase on individual caseworkers, I, I know that my introduction to HCRS uh, with, with regards to my sister, a single caseworker might have two to three people keeping them busy. And we're, we're going to talk with some folks from HCRS in, um, in the next segment uh, that will drill down a little deeper as to what those people now have to, have to endure on a day-to-day -day basis just to try to keep the workload moving forward and not letting people slip through the cracks, which is increasingly hard. And I hope this is what we learn today. It's very difficult. I'm actually a representative payee for 10 people in the Brattleboro community, and I work mm -hmm. with uh, some wonderful people from HCRS and Families First. And I get phone calls any time of the day, any day, from one of my one of my folks that they've just been rehospitalized. I had someone that just came out of the hospital yesterday afternoon that doesn't really have anywhere to live. Are we going to be able to avoid another crisis? I don't think so. Um, it's it's really it's really a sad situation. I had a psychiatrist tell me about 20 years ago that we're going to have a crisis in Vermont, and we truly do. We well, truly do. It is it, it is a is a, it's a very systemic problem um, where we have people like Gene's son, who is a, at any given point in time a mile or two miles from his home, but is homeless as a result of of not being able to, and this is not to disparage any of the organizations that have to deal with this, they can only deal with you as they are dealt with. So it, it falls right from the top down. Um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I serve on a board of the Groundworks Collaborative, which helps homeless people. And we know, I've, I've identified people that I know have homes, but as a result of their illness are homeless. And it's, it's, it's really one of the reasons that we're here today. Absolutely. Uh, one of the one of our one of the I goals would be to have community supported housing, reasonable housing, and a community supported. What does that mean? Well, originally when they started closing hospitals, mental hospitals, and some of the places where the services were not the best, the idea was go back into the community and be supported. So that means you have healthcare workers that can visit you. You have folks that can make sure you're okay. They can catch the early warning signs that maybe something's wrong, which you cannot necessarily see in an office visit. You can go in and go, oh yeah, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Nobody knows that your house is a mess, you know, that you've stopped eating right. There's no food in your fridge. Um, and so community supported housing and more money for our designated agencies so they can provide that is, is, our, is our ultimate goals. We're going to take a short break now to change over the panel. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Judy Seiler, Gene Clough, as well as my colleague Fish uh, for sharing your personal stories to get this conversation started. We'll be back with more Call to Action Mental Health from Brooks Memorial Library after this. Welcome back to A Call to Action. Today we're tackling mental health. In this segment, uh, we are joined by Kurt White from the Brattleboro Retreat and Kristen Noof. Noof. All right, from HCRS. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the forum. We could just get you to lean into the mic a little bit. Sure. Don't be afraid of it. Uh. <laughs> well, uh, we paired the two of you together. Uh, I, was, I was just talking to you off there about uh, because of the populations that you both serve in your respective organizations. Kurt with the Bradford Retreat, uh, Kristen with HCRS. Uh, Kurt, one of the populations that, that you work with there, and, and you do a lot of the patient outreach for a lot of the different groups uh, through the Bradford Retreat. But you work directly with Groundworks Collaborative with a lot of the people they serve. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Sure. We uh, we uh, we established a, um, uh, a sort of a, tr a pilot program la 
last year, about a year ago, that uh, involved having a clinician sort of embedded in the facility, uh, in the homeless shelter facility for, uh, last year it was 12 hours a week, this year we've upped it to 16 hours a week uh, and sort of shifted the hours around uh, to try to decrease barriers to access to services um, uh, for very complex individuals. Uh, some of the, some of, uh, some individuals struggling with some of the most complex mental health and substance abuse problems also have lots of complicated psychosocial issues like transportation problems, financial problems, um, absence of uh, support and have uh, are struggling sometimes with um, uh, complicated uh, trauma histories and other sorts of things. All of these things together can make for uh, a, a real uh, challenging picture sometimes in terms of having somebody uh, sort of make it to regularly scheduled appointments at a very particular appointed time in an office in an every weekly way. And one of the um, one of the things that's sort of near and dear to my heart is, is sort of trying to make sure that people who have really treatable mental health problems connect with treatment resources that can really help them. Um, and a lot of times that doesn't happen in the ways that we uh, want it to for a variety of reasons, including stigma, um, um, uh, mistaken impressions about what substance, uh, substance abuse and mental health treatment might uh, look like in people's lives, and just sort of a um, lack of practical abilities to make it to treatment sometimes. And so we're trying to, to sort of play around with this in creative ways uh, to try to make it so that people, uh, to decrease the, uh, the barriers that people might have in accessing treatment. That's one way that we're trying to do that. So yeah. far seems to be working pretty well. <laughs> so far, so good. Well, and, and Kristen, uh, working for HCRS, that's a, a organization that provides a lot of different services uh, as kind of an umbrella organization supporting other agencies. Uh, but your role as community su support specialist, specifically for the Brattleboro Police Department, you're really a boots on the ground kind of operative in this whole scenario. Absolutely, and the people that I work with are just as wide a uh, venue. Every service that's offered in Brattleboro, when the police run into people and offer supports, I'm right there, starting from scratch. Uh, each individual and what they need, and they're the ones that define what they need. There is no recipe, and decisions need to be made. People need to be very receptive right then and there in that second that the police and I run into people. Yeah, and I want to let everybody know who's here in, in the audience here. If you want to step up to the podium and, and make comments or, or ask questions of Kurt and Kristen, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. We'll recognize you when you get up there. Uh, but I, I'd like to continue in talking about some of the challenges and, and some of those other social issues that, that come into play uh, for the populations you serve. Uh, what are some of the ones that are, are evolving and coming more to the forefront that are impacting uh, the mental health aspect when you when you think about these populations. Well, I'd say that there's there's a great deal of co-occurring mental health and substance abuse problems these days. Uh, that seems like the uh, the sort of opioid epidemic that we're in the in the grips of is uh, uh, has really been a, a real tragedy for the the state and the region uh, in terms of the the sort of uh, uh, both loss of life from from overdose uh, and also the uh, a sort of a, uh, a tremendous struggle that those problems bring to uh, individuals, families, and and communities. Uh, and I'd say that. Um, uh, there's a great deal, uh, probably more, co-occurring substance abuse problems with mental health problems than there than there was uh, in the past. Although that's not, strictly speaking, a new issue. <laughs> yeah, thoughts uh, on contributing factors uh, from you, Kristen, as well. Absolutely, we uh, work with several duly diagnosed individuals in the course of of a week, in the course of a day, and we're working with what we have offered with us. It's not unusual that I'll be sitting in the emergency room with a person for days offering them supports. It's not unusual that we'll go down the system of care and, and, and from initially landing and determining what the person needs all the way down to whether or not they need uh, uh, halfway house, three-quarter way house, and sometimes they have to do that outside of Vermont unfortunately because of the limitations we have for what's offered. Now, just thinking about the times that you encounter people having these, uh, having an episode perhaps at its most acute, it strikes me a lot of times, that's uh, where you come into the picture, uh, and, and then hearing uh, some of the conversations we had in the previous segment around the idea of, of helping people be self-empowered, of helping people get ahead of it. Is that, is that a role you're able to play 
uh, in, in that situation when, when you're doing these things, or, or do you refer them to somebody else within your respective organizations? How does that element of it work once you get somebody uh, calmed down or, or out of those, uh, those acute episodes? Well, one of the most important things I think about uh, sort of the mental health system is that it is a system and that the pieces of it need to function uh, well together. Uh, you know, that there are moments where people need some of the most intensive sorts of treatment, like inpatient hospitalization, mm -hmm. and hopefully, if all is going well, and it, it doesn't always, that the person is able to get that uh, right when they need it and avoid things like long emergency room mm -hmm. uh, sort of waits for the right kind of inpatient bed or something like that. And then, uh, as some of the panelists in the last segment talked about, there, there needs to be uh, sort of, you know, not only good treatment at that level, but also then a really smooth handoff to what happens outside of the hospital. Uh, and that there need to be the, the resources that we need uh, 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 in order to really support the person at that level. And sometimes that might mean something like an intensive day program, like an in intensive outpatient or partial hospital program. The retreat, retreat has some of uh, both of those. There are also some other resources uh, around the state uh, for, for, uh, for that, uh, uh, for folks that we serve in the inpatient services here. Um, and, and that can really sort of help bridge the person from a sort of totally contained environment to sort of like outpatient once a week or twice a week psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, even so, uh, that transition is often fraught with uh, a lot of anxiety on the part of individuals and families, and, and this sort of post-hospitalization period can be a very risky and dangerous time where people need a lot of both formal and informal treatment supports. Yeah. Kristen, from, from your point of view, uh, when people are at these most acute, there's also this aspect perhaps of a crime uh, that you're having to deal with. How does that complicate the issue for you in terms of your, in your work? Well, although uh, when the police are there, they're working with uh, statutes and if a person broke the law or not, and there's not so much choice involved, when I enter into the picture, I'm offering choices which they have free will and choice whether they want to take part in or not. Sometimes it's very helpful to be elbow to elbow with an officer and suggest certain treatment uh, as an alternate sanction or in addition to what's happening as a motivator. Uh, we are first responders, but many times if a person establishes some good rapport, I can support them along the way of the continuum of care. Kurt, uh, you had mentioned um, a number about a program uh, getting shifted from 12 to 16 hours, mm -hmm. which sounds like a big win, but I'm, I just deal with things on a very emotional level. Mm -hmm. Knowing the problems that we have, knowing the amount of work and good work that the retreat does in this community to helping kind of dissolve these problems, is 16 hours even enough? Well, you know, treatment resources is always a part of the picture. You know, I, I think we're, we're struggling to sort of uh, transition a mental health system from one that thinks about sort of payment for sort of widgets of services or number of hours to one that really takes care of the individual and all of their needs in the community. Uh, and I think we're, we're beginning to get better at doing things like that by collaborating more uh, sort of with one another. You know, we have a lot of, a lot of collaborations that Retreat does in the room with HCRS and with Groundworks Collaborative and other agencies, uh, uh, BMH, primary care offices and folks like that to try to make sure that it's not just about sort of the number, the number of hours here, the number of hours there, but, but that an individual, regardless of the problem that they're having and regardless of, of where they choose to come into the system, is able to be identified and treated with, with timely evidence-based treatments and interventions. Okay. Um, and so I think, um, uh, and I think sort of how we spread the resources around here and there is always an ongoing sort of difficulty. I, I think we'll see. So if they gave you 32 hours, that wouldn't upset you? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know I'm not going to say no to more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I think there's always a, always a need, and the more sort of flexibility that sometimes we can have with funding, um, you know, the better off uh, probably everybody is in communities uh, because we can start to think outside the box and reach people in ways that, that we may have not been able to reach them before because of the, the limits uh, uh, that are partly financial and partly the sort of, uh, sort of funding mechanisms themselves put us in. Great. Thank you. You're listening to uh, 100.3 FM and AM 1490. It's a call to action, and we're, we're drilling down into mental health. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have a, a question from, from the audience. So we'll be back right after these messages. 
Welcome back to WKVT's Call to Action Forum on Mental Health, broadcasting live from the meeting room at Brooks Memorial Library. Chris Lenoir and my colleague Fish here talking with a number of people in the community about the issue of mental health. We've opened this up uh, to members of the public to come and speak and ask questions. And uh, right now we have Chad Simmons at the podium. Thanks, Chad. Hi, thank you for having this conversation. Uh, so my name is Chad. I'm a uh, regional coordinator for Building Bright Futures. We do early childhood uh, advocacy work and um, wanted to kind of piggyback off the conversation around resource allocation in particular looking at equitable resource allocation across our county um, in terms of we're a predominantly rural county um, and looking at the resource needs for children and families in particular previous uh, speaker talked about attachment and what we're seeing in the conversations that we're having is that families and children are um, the needs of those families are, are increasing in terms of um, trauma within the family, attachment issues, substance abuse, uh, fragile housing situations. So I want to just ask the question around what do you see the needs um, and how do you see the resource allocation um, being distributed across the county, uh, in, across the diverse geographic, um, uh, class, gender needs around, specifically around children and families. Mm -hmm. We'll ask uh, both Kurt and, and Kristen to react to that. If they'd like, Kristen, do you sure, want to go first? Okay. Sure. Uh, the police and I often work uh, directly with DCF and the court system. Uh, oftentimes we'll have that chunk of time between the actual crisis and um, service coordination and connecting kids and families with whomever they need. And yes, in the last 10, 20 years, the level of acuity has definitely risen. Um, so what we're seeing is people, the kids in general, that will come into the police department and sometimes I'll sit with them all night and try to establish some level of rapport and trust before they connect with wh whomever they need to, whether it's DCF, their counselor, or anyone involved. Um, there's no recipe for that. It's, it's just a matter of connecting with the individual. And yes, there are unfortunately are kids that are doing drugs that you couldn't even imagine at ages you couldn't even imagine. And um, yeah, they do have all sorts of uh, myriad of problems that need to be addressed. Uh, and I, I guess I would echo uh, a lot of that also. I mean, I do think there is uh, definitely an increase in the uh, uh, acuity of things. Some of that has to do with the, the sort of um, uh, substance abuse and co-occurring issues uh, and the way that those uh, have affected uh, families. Uh, uh, opioid addiction in particular seems to be something sort of disproportionately affecting uh, young people with a degree of impairment that uh, you might not have uh, seen quite as quickly as you would with like an, an alcohol dependence problem, uh, for example. Um, I, I sort of, my caveat would be, I suppose, I'm, I'm really mostly uh, an adult clinician. I'm actually a clinician, too. I still do some, some therapy work in the evenings and, and whatnot. Uh, and so I'm a little bit less sort of mm -hmm. connected to the child system. Uh, I, I know it's quite a complex system because you have the sort of needs of the family, the needs uh, of the individual parents, the needs of the child, and often sort of multiple levels of systemic involvement. Uh, and so uh, uh, certainly we... Uh, get involved with that at the retreat uh, uh, every day. It's a little bit away from my own direct experience, uh, and so I don't don't know what I can say about uh, resource allocation uh, really specifically. Anything else you want to add to that? No, I appreciate that, and I, th okay. I think as we continue the conversation, I think it's really important to look at the overlapping, how the mental health system overlaps with the early childhood system, overlaps with the medical system, overlaps with all of the other systems. And I think oh, yeah. you spoke to it quite eloquently before, like how the pieces of those systems interact. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, yeah, thank, thank, you, thank, Chad, you. thank you. And, and I do want to say, even though I identified Chad and he identified himself, that is not required to get up and speak at the microphone. Uh, we do respect people's privacy here. You don't need to identify yourself. And, and sir, I see you uh, up at the microphone. Please step forward. Yes, my name is Les Thomas, and I have lived the ultimate um, Right, I guess it would say. I was a healthy, normal person with a nice family, nice job. In 1993, a, a door knob hit me in the back. Um, in 2001, I was an opiate ad addict mm. with morphine for pain. Mm. I have been arrested. I use that word. Maybe I shouldn't be, but held, let out of my house in handcuffs because I mm. called for help mm. and a crisis was done. That took a lot of 
things now that you know, it's very hard to do and how to because there was neighbors uh-huh. around watching me being let out in handcuffs uh, and things like this mm-hmm. I've lost approximately 65 pounds and haven't worked since 2001 because of this condition my family I've been divorced by my wife because she can't stand hearing that phone ring at her workplace and wondering if it's me going to have another call in from the ER telling her you better get down here I have committed I tried to commit suicide once um, but it's a hell of a life and unfortunately there's nothing they can do I'd like to get off of the the morphine and maybe try you know medical marijuana to see if that would help the pain it would certainly reduce my addictness to the things I'm on but I take 22 drugs a day 22 Mm -hmm. pills a day is what I take for my problems which everyone just wants to keep adding. Oh, a pill? You feel this symptom? Here's another pill, take this. Here's another one. And going, as I say, I take 22 pills a day now. And it's a hell of a life, I'll tell you. And anybody that doesn't have any mental illness or because of a work-related problem, you know, God bless you guys because you need to keep looking and being active all the time. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Les. I think Les touches on something that, and I know that the retreat has run campaigns about about the stigma that is often associated uh, with that and, and trying to dispel what we who don't suffer from problems like, like Les's or uh, like Gene's son have is just kind of uh, just, just shut your front door and it goes away um, thing. How difficult is that? Because the both of you are... are right there in the face of it all the time and you probably see that a lot and you think to yourself a lot you know if somebody had just called 10 minutes ago all of this could have been avoided you know how often do you see things like that i think uh chief fitzgerald is acutely aware of the connection between uh, mental health substance abuse and people who connect with the police department and how it's certainly not a one-dimensional solution to simply arrest people, which is part of the reason why I'm working at the police department. And the officers and um, everyone at the Brattleboro Police Department try their very best to um, assist people in a holistic way, looking at their needs spiritually, physically, mentally, and not simply in in a one-dimensional way of have they broken a law or not. That's a process. It's a process that happens over time. But I can tell you that the chief, and he'll answer to this much more eloquently than I am, but he's very aware of connecting with the community and addressing each issue in more of a therapeutic way, in a holistic way as well. That in and of itself, and, and, and we'll... We'll, we'll get a little deeper into that in the next segment as, as Chief Fitzgerald will be on, on the panel with us. Um, but that in and of itself in these situations, which can honestly go from calm to dangerous in the snap of a finger, to try to bring that skill set forward in this panic situation. I, there's a reason I'm in radio, and that's one of them. <laughs> Can, can I add something? Please, to, please I, do. I think uh, the, uh, um, um, gentleman brings up quite a number of really important points. I, I think one of them also is that mental health problems uh, can and, and often do happen to everyone over the course of a lifetime, that it's really important for us to, to try to think of it that way, uh, that, that people who have mental health problems are not some group over here that's separate from us. Uh, uh, they are literally us. Uh, they're our, our friends and neighbors and ourselves, um, and it's not at all unusual for people to have some level of, of struggle with mental health problems or addiction uh, over the course of a lifetime. Um, the, the goal uh, sort of on the treatment side is really just to try to make sure that people can can connect to effective kinds of help and treatment um, sooner rather than later. And it sounds like that, that's been a challenge uh, some, sometimes. Um, and I think it, it gets a lot harder even when you have complicated medical issues and pain disorders that often uh, go along with um, uh, mental health problems. And, and we're, we're trying to do some things to work on and uh, sort, of, sort of less interventional pain management techniques, too, to try to prevent some of the, the downstream problems that have resulted from, from uh, sort of uh, awful uh, stories like that uh, uh, in the community and in the future. So. Well, thank you very much for... Um for being a part of our panel today, and uh, we really appreciate it. I think you've, I think you've brought some some good information uh, to the table that that gives us, and that's what the whole thing is about. So please, we're going to put it out there to our audience that's here. We have a fairly packed house today, so yeah. don't don't feel um, don't be afraid that you have to uh, 
not say anything. If you really feel the need to say something, please get up. And we do have somebody uh, who is at the microphone who we will get to in the next segment, uh, because right now we are... We are challenged by what we call the clock yes. back at the studio. Yes, it is yeah. time for the top of the hour break here, uh, but we will continue with this live call to action mental health forum from Brooks Memorial Library. We're here until noon, so people out in the listening audience can certainly come and join us here uh, in this conversation. Back with more on WKVT 100.3 FM and AM 1490. Welcome back to A Call to Action. Today we are drilling down on mental health and uh, trying to get some answers and to hearing people's frustrations. And uh, Chris, if we've learned anything so far, is there, there are plenty of frustrations. There are also some good solutions, uh, some that I've learned that I had no idea about. And um, coming to kind of, if, if you will, what I think that the state of Vermont has kind of gravitated towards is taking our first responders and making them their first first point of entry into these situations, which I've never thought was fair. I understand that when there's a situation that's gone awry, you need the police there, you need rescue there. So uh, we welcome to the panel uh, for this segment, uh, Chief Mike Fitzgerald from the Brattleboro Police Department and Drew Hazelton from Rescue Incorporated. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So let's, uh, let, let's, let's start with you, Chief, and uh, tell us a little bit. And now we know when you're called in, some of the challenges that you that you have to face when you are arresting somebody with a mental illness. Yes, um, there's absolutely no question that law enforcement officers are increasingly the ones responding to people with uh, suffering from a mental health crisis. Um, and I, I, this is just um, a lot of it's my opinion and looking at this from a law enforcement perspective. And I, I think that's just a natural outgrowth from a mental health system that cannot meet the needs uh, for the treatment until the person with that mental health in the illness is dangerous. And police officers are forced to become frontline mental health workers. The safety of both law enforcement officers and citizens is compromised when law enforcement responds to a crisis involving people with severe mental illness who are not being treated. The law permits officers to take these individuals into custody and transport them to the hospital if they meet the legal criteria for an evaluation. Part of the problem is someone must be a danger to themselves or others before they can be treated over objection. Police are called when a person deteriorates to a dangerous condition. Police are also called when that person with a mental illness is symptomatic but the mental health system cannot respond because that person does not yet qualify as being dangerous. As inpatient beds continue to dwindle, hospitals close, and funding is decreased, means that people who are in crisis end up in the streets or jails instead of treatment. That means more interactions with law enforcement instead of medical personnel. Police officers are often called in to intervene with homeless people who are delusional, transport people with severe mental illness who need emergency evaluations, manage domestic disturbances, incidents of violence, and threats of suicide. What we have done at the Brattleboro Police Department when we recognize some of these uh, deficiencies is we have a social worker that was on earlier in, in your show, and she explained uh, quite eloquently uh, what her job was, and I can tell you right now that that has absolutely helped us in so many ways. Police officers are not mental health workers. Cut and dry. We're not mental health workers. And suffering from a mental health crisis is not a crime. Being addicted to a substance is not a crime. Those people need medical treatment. They don't need law enforcement intervention. We're there to make sure that Christian is safe, People in the home are safe, people in the neighborhood are safe, and that individual suffering from that crisis is safe. So I don't know. I, again, I, I, I joked before the break that, that I'm, I'm in radio for a reason. That's one of them, uh, is to how to untangle it. Your training is very specific. You're peace officers. You enforce the law. You make sure that everybody is moving around, uh, moving around our community in, in a lawful manner. And as you said, and I think it's, it's a brilliant point that we should sharpen, is having a mental illness is not against the law. It is nothing that you can control. But yet you find yourselves and your officers and the, and, the, and, and the guys that do the good work underneath you having to be that front line person. And I've seen your officers deal with that here locally firsthand. 
and having that gentle hand when somebody is honestly just off the rails and trying to control that situation, I don't know how many levels of training you have to go through to get there, but it's really not probably when they decided at one point in time, I want to be a police officer, what they thought they would be doing. That's absolutely correct. A lot of people are surprised on the uh, amount of quality of life issues that we deal with. Criminal issues is not so much, but you'll find out in the training that a majority of your training is dealt towards statutes and criminal law and not so much in community and quality of life issues. We have turned that around down at the Brattleboro Police Station. Um, we concentrate more on uh, community and quality of life issues. And with that being said, uh, we have a, a social worker on, on staff and we absolutely rely on her expertise and insight knowledge uh, in, into the system to get that person the help that they need. Uh, we go to what they call team two training. We attend uh, the training up at the academy on dealing with people with mental health crisis. And that's, that's standard. You, you come to my department, you're gonna go to those trainings. Uh, cut and dry and uh, we're very serious about that so the whole mindset has changed and I'd like to address the gentleman that uh, was discussing earlier 20 years ago and it is unfortunate that's exactly how law enforcement responded to mental health crises we went in we we put handcuffs on you and you probably went downstairs and spent the weekend or at least the night uh, in our in our cell and then the following day you you were released and that accomplished absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. So what we're doing now is we're addressing this, the situation as it is. It's, it's a mental health crisis. We, um, we know that uh, often the cycle of this is police department comes, they, they, you, you do your due diligence, you find that this person is exactly fits the benefit. They get put into a uh, small emergency room at the hospital, usually a sheriff or if it's local PD is there to guard outside the room. There's some, there's some wasted resources right there until they can find an open bed, at which point they're transferred to that open bed and that they are held for three days in that open bed and uh, so they can get their medications back on and they deem them fine and push them back out the door. But that's the system. Mm -hmm. That's not the fault of anybody that we're talking today. That's the fault of the system. And having to drill down now, I had talked with Drew on the phone the other day uh, about how many times he, they, Rescue Inc., has had to come in and keep, <laughs> if you will, a revolving door. Yeah, so, and when we were talking, some of the important pieces that we'd like to put out is uh, we work very close with law enforcement because during these mental health crises, quite often patients are uh, violent and we rely on on law enforcement to help make it safe for our providers to get out and actually provide uh, that emergency medical treatment that they're getting on the scene. Um, but what's very concerning is we see the same patients. We see the same patients that we've entered into the mental health system. Uh, we'll see them sometimes days later, sometimes weeks later. Uh, there are patients that are engaging in requests for emergency services dozens of times a year because the system is failing. Our mental health system is not meeting the needs of, of our citizens. And it's very sad to see the same patients with the same mental health issues over and over again. I can't imagine the amount of times you folks have seen these same faces, these same bodies come <coughs> through the door and are proud. Now, I'm going to put words in your mouth. So th this is me talking and not them and just saying, you know, what? Is it going to take? How many more times do we have to bring this individual in until we find a solution that is really just going to stick or at least have some promise of gaining some traction? I, it, I'm, I'm sure that's got to be a daily conversation in, in, both, in both of your uh, places of work. I, what we have tried at our department, and uh, it has, it has worked great, and that's with the work through our social worker and, and, and pretty much the uh, assisted outpatient treatment program. I mean, once again, it's from a law enforcement right. perspective that we look at it because we will have individuals that are in need, uh, but they haven't yet met that threshold where, you know, we can, we can bring them to the ER for evaluation. So Kristen will reach out and just basically intervene and talk to them 
and things of that nature. And it has, it has helped us from a law enforcement uh, perspective. Um, I really, maybe someone from the mental health uh, profession can see how that helps them out. But I know from a law enforcement, just having that outreach um, available right. has, has helped us. So you, you had referred back to 20 years ago where basically you would just show up, slap some cuffs on them, chuck them in a cell, fingerprint them, mugshot them, and, and, and just go back upstairs, grab a cup of coffee, and release them the next day. So what I'm uh, hearing is there have been some positive gains in dealing with these because you now because 20 years ago did you have a, uh, the likes of a christian absolutely not nor did we have the training right so so th there are certain aspects even though i will make the argument that you're still not the people that should have to be executing this but you're the front line people you're sent right to the front line every time the phone rings and you show up it's not a it's not a bright spot in somebody's day um <laughs> <laughs> Usually no, not. No, no, <laughs> nothing personal. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, the situation is not good. If, if right. they're looking at Chief Fitzgerald or Drew Hazleton from Rescue, um, if, if they are showing up at your door, it's because somebody called them and, and the situation has, has lost all control of, of reason and manner. Right. Um, and for you to guys to have to deal with that on a, on a, on a daily basis is um, got to be somewhat frustrating. It is frustrating, but at the same time, we look back and, and we celebrate our successes, and there's there's room for improvement. We, we absolutely uh, believe that, and we're striving for that. However, it's, it's good to know that when we do encounter someone that is homeless or suffering from addiction or mental illness, and we're finding a lot of it is intertwined. It's not like in a silo. Right. You know, a lot of it is, is intertwined that we now, with our relationships with all the different agencies, uh, recovery, groundworks, and, and things of that nature, we're, we're now more capable of explaining to these individuals, giving them cards, talking to them, letting them know, you know, if, if you're really thinking about, you know, trying to uh, recover from your addiction, go to recovery. We know these people. And we make it more personable instead of just, hey, you can't be sleeping here. Get up, get out, right. move on. You know, we're actually addressing the problem. Which is, uh, which, is a, which is a strong statement coming from the police department of trying to actually, you know, deal with these things in, in a manner of which that leaves people with a little dignity. Absolutely. Which is, which is I mean, if you leave somebody with some dignity, you, you've, you've got a shot. Mm -hmm. You're in the game. We'll continue our panel discussion with Brattleboro Police Chief Mike Fitzgerald and Chief of Operations at Rescue Inc. Drew Hazelton in just a minute. We also have somebody patiently waiting at the microphone to speak, and we'll get to her uh, right after these short commercial messages. Call to Action Mental Health from Brooks Memorial Library on WKVT. Welcome back to Call to Action Mental Health, a forum live from Brooks Memorial Library here on WKVT. Chris Lenoir and Fish moderating it. The panelists here, uh, Chief Mike Fitzgerald of the Brattleboro Police Department and Drew Hazelton of Rescue, have uh, queued up uh, some people wanting to comment on things they're talking about here and, and things in general over the past uh, hour and a half, roughly, that we've been talking about this. Uh, uh, Miss, uh, please come up to the mic. Hi, my name is Katie Wilson, and I uh, work at the Copeland Center for Wellness and Recovery. And, um, you know, we've been talking about a lot of system-wide issues, and I think that that is something that's extremely important for us to understand sort of what the barriers and opportunities are within the system. But sort of just as a citizen, I, you know, want help in thinking of ideas for both myself and for my, you know, fellow community members about things that we can do to both uh, lesson uh, lessons we can learn about how to help people in our own community that aren't necessarily you know that moment when we call the police um, because I think that there are opportunities for us to do things as you know neighbors and community members uh, to help out that are outside of the system wide because a lot of times it's hard to think about what I can do to affect exactly how the system interacts with people but I can think about how I can help my neighbors 
Yeah, a very good point. And I, I think uh, Kurt White, when he was up here, talked a little bit about the retreat Stand Up to Stigma campaign and, and how we as a community can be more inclusive in a lot of these situations. Uh, but but applying that to, to the work that the two panelists do here, I mean, certainly when you're on the scene responding to these issues, uh, it's a situation that attracts onlookers. Uh, for better or for worse in a lot of these situations. Uh, are there ways that the public can, can help you, uh, ways that the public can, can work with you in, in these situations? Drew? So generally by the time uh, you know, emergency services have been contacted, the situation has escalated to a point where maybe the patient themselves are, is concerned or a family member or a neighbor. So usually by the time, I would say, by the time we're involved in the situation, there's really not a lot of of help um, that we can get from outside from neighbors with the exception of information and trying to help us understand the the situation will better help us guide the, the person into the right services so a lot of patients as i said uh, are repeat patients we we understand we know them uh, we know their history and we can help refer them to services uh, but it may be a, a patient we're unfamiliar with and having information of, on a friend or a family and, and making sure that you relay that information to the responders so that we can hopefully get them into the right treatment program would be beneficial. And Chief Fitzgerald, I know that you're a big proponent of community policing. Uh, it strikes me that uh, what Katie brought up here is, is a factor in terms of how your officers interact with the public. Absolutely. And I'd like to add on what Drew was saying is, you know, once once you see, uh, once they're, you know the individual a lot better than we do, and call early and call often. Don't wait until it reaches that 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 critical time where we have to intervene, uh, because what we can do is we can show up, we can uh, notify Christian, our social health worker, who more times than not would be right there with us when we respond, and just I think early intervention would would be key. Absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that to the attention. We have other people uh, standing waiting to comment. Uh, please step up, sir. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, George Karapakakis, uh, CEO at HCRS. And well, first of all, I, I want to applaud and I want to thank the chief for his, the collaboration and the partnership because this, we have been, at, you know, at HCRS, we've been working with the Brattleboro PD. And actually, we, this program started in Bellows Falls in 2003. And we started, uh, to give sort of a little bit of history, uh, we started uh, with four hours of one of our crisis staff embedded in the police department. And we worked one family at a time, one person at a time. And uh, so it's really, it has really made a difference. And now we have this police social worker program between here and Hartford. And it really has made a difference because as, as, as the chief said, uh, mental illness is not a crime. We can't, as we've heard, I'm sure, other times, we can't arrest our way out of this situation. We need to work together and collaborate. And this has been a great collaboration and a partnership. And I also want to say that for those first probably 10 years, we've been funding this program through sort of a beating the bushes and a patchwork of funding from United Way to town funding. And in, uh, when Irene came uh, through Vermont and there was Act 79, which supported some community initiatives, some grant funding through the Department of Mental Health, and the legislators, in their wisdom, really put, it, put those funds out into the community. And those are grant dollars that are going to support our police social workers. And, it's, uh, and that is a good thing. Uh, clearly, we need more. There's no question. But anyway, so I want to thank the chief for that for that partnership, and and also legislators in the state for for really putting that out there, so we can really support these kinds of programs. So great. Well, thank you, and thank we'll you. be hearing more from uh, George here in the next segment, yeah. along with Morning Fox from the Department of Mental Health. Uh, we he, have a couple he's other. He's not getting off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have we have a couple other people. Please, ma'am, go you. ahead. Um, I just wanted to add on to what George was just saying about how we were able to create a flexible program here because of patching together different pieces of a system. And we've talked a few times today about the system and how it's not people's fault, it's the system's fault. And I think it's important to remember that the system is actually made up of people. People write grants, people decide funding, people make policy, and people can change policy. 
And all that said, even if our mental health system was working absolutely perfectly and everyone here is doing the best they can, we would still have ill people. We would still have people relapsing. And the increased mental illness happening in this community over the last 20 years isn't necessarily the fault of people or of the system. It's we have an incredibly stressful society that we're living in that creates and perpetuates, you know, different triggers and mental illness. And I think we need to remember that as we're taking our role as citizens, that it's not just about the mental health system or the police department. It's all of our responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, well I know said. that um, and we have we have a couple more questions I want to get to. Uh, one of the situations that, that I've learned through um, through friends of mine who are police officers, when you get to a situation like this and there is that stigma and there is this dealings with it that if you are out there gawking, if you are rubbernecking to find out what's going on and you're standing outside and the police officer tells you, just go back to your homes, we've got this under control, you should do that. Because having you not there, and you can speak to this more directly than I can, will be more of a help. Uh, with you standing out there, it's more of a hindrance. I agree. And it's... it's we got to get rid of that stigma. It, it's that's just paramount. That's that's the first step. That way, people will want to seek out help. They will they will appreciate when we when we show up. And I mean, not you're not going to hear that very often. <laughs> uh, but it's it's just that one step towards recovery. Where that's the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, and it's okay that when we go there and you know it's unfortunate, like we talked about earlier, that that gentleman was led away in handcuffs. I mean that that is that's not how you treat an individual. No, it's a human being with a problem right. and should be treated as such. Mm -hmm. So, do do we have another uh, another step right up? Don't be shy. I'm not really a public speaker, but my name is Teresa. I work at the library, and I always appreciate when the police come. <laughs> um, <laughs> really, um, gosh, I don't know how to say this. Um, <laughs> um, we have a very compassionate community and uh, the library is really a safe place for people to come. So for that reason, we have people that are here that sometimes if we want to prevent a crisis, it would be nice to have those resources come by and say, how are you doing? Do you need help today? And I know that we just don't have enough. I'm so glad Kristen's here. I've called her before too, but um, she's not always available mm -hmm. and she's out on a job. I mean, it's really, there's not enough. And um, the call to, a to action is we need somebody to call. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and so. most people don't necessarily think of the library as a, a place to come by, but it is an open they, public they space. Do think of it. And they so they here. do. No, I mean, they do, but I mean, I think the general public don't necessarily right. uh, are aware of that. So it's great that See, you're bringing and, that and, to everybody's and, and attention. And, and I'll raise my hand to what Chris is saying. Yeah. I, would have, I would have never thought in that vein that this would be a place that the police would have to respond to for these type of issues. I mean, we know that th we know that the problems exist everywhere, but it right. sounds to me like it's it's a it's a bigger problem than I could have ever imagined. Right. Well, we yeah. try to get them to respond before it's a crisis. Yeah. I mean, you can tell. Right. And um and sometimes we ask people, "Do you need help?" No, don't call them because they don't want to go through that revolving sure. door again. They know the routine. <laughs> if they're yeah. they're repetitive, and we need to stop that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, would you like to step Thanks. forward? Yeah. Hey, I'm Knowles Wentworth from HCRS, and my, my role over there is I, I'm a member of the crisis team, but I'm also uh, area manager for the uh, adult CRT program. So I just want to share an insider perspective from, from our lens, from within inside HCRS. Um, and that is that, you know, because we talk about, you know, first responders needing to intervene, and it's usually too late at that stage, which I fully agree with, by the way, because, uh, again, as a crisis screener, I, I would also agree with that. Um, from the CRT program, for those who don't know, that stands for Community Rehabilitation and Treatment. And it's basically, a, it's a, these are, these are state-funded programs throughout the state with all the designated agencies. And these are for individuals who go in and out of the hospital somewhat frequently, have severe mental health challenges, and, and a host of other issues, uh, potentially. And so from within inside that program, you know, one of the first things that we try to do is establish the best relationship we can, knowing that really the, 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 the best prevention from keeping people from kind of going into crisis is the relationship, the rapport we have with the individual, but it has to be coupled with some insight on their part. 
because what we find over and over and over again is that when folks are um, are are they challenged by challenged by their mental health struggles to such a degree where there's there's not a tremendous amount of insight around it, and the relationship isn't really where it needs to be, then when folks start to derail, if you will, um, we 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 try interventions all along the the path, especially if they're a member of our CRT team, and um, we we get to a point where it's like um, there's a point of no return where we feel like oh no, now we have to wait for that involuntary hospitalization thing. And it's almost, it's almost uncanny um, the way in which we can kind of see this going. You know, we see someone slipping, we try various interventions, but if the relationship wasn't well established and the individual is really struggling with insight into their struggles, then uh, we find that it's, it's the, they really start to slip faster than we'd, than we'd like. And at some point, we too have to sit back and wait for that final phase of them to be uh, involuntarily hospitalized. And, and that gap there uh, is really challenging. For th That's what I wanted to convey, that from our perspective as individuals working with these people, uh, that gap of time there where we wait is really a challenge. We sit back with, with a good degree of sadness and frustration over that, that same uh, er period as well. Just Thank wanted to make knows. that comment. So, uh, you know, we, we talk about these gaps, and it seems like there, there's a lot of this when we come down. And, and I don't know um, if, if throwing more money at it is the solution. Uh, I don't know that it's not the solution. Better funding. Um, the training sounds like it's there. Uh, it sounds like some of this training might be being forced on onto an already overworked force and in, in terms of both the police department and, and Rescue Inc. Who, uh, because if, if Drew is out dealing with uh, a mental health issue and somebody uh, on the other side of town is having a real medical issue, which is what you, I mean, it, it, it's, it's resources spent and it, it's time away from what your organization was formed to do. Same can be said about the police department and your frustrations must be run plenty deep. Yeah, it's a... It's certainly a stress uh, for, for rescue, the increase in the, the quantity of mental health uh, patients we see, as well as the number of mental health transports we see. So people don't think about what happens after these patients have been admitted to the emergency room. The emergency room is not a place to treat mental health issues. So they need to be moved to a facility that can treat them. Sometimes that's hours, sometimes that's days, and in some cases it's been weeks between when they were brought into an emergency room and when there's a, a place available. So the other kind of st stress on our system is we're called upon to pick these patients up and at the hospital, the local facilities, and move them to uh, treatment facilities. And what we've noticed is those treatment facilities are further and further away. The, the facilities aren't available locally. So now they're moving patients to unfamiliar areas in Boston and Connecticut and in, in a distance. So we're seeing more and more of that as, you know, this increase in quantity yeah. uh, of patients. So and, and that, that puts a, a, another light on a, on a situation that you're moving people away from what little support they may have or, or what big support advocacies they may have locally here and transferring them down to the nutmeg state doesn't seem like a really smart move. but. If your your hand is forced, your hand is forced. If that's the only available treatment bed, then that's what they get, and it may not be the right bed. It, right. Moving them out of this community may be more stressful for them. Mm. But, so, yeah. and HCRS does an excellent job trying to find placements, and it's very difficult to find, you know, inpatient placements for patients, which is why quite often we end up moving these patients at you know all hours of the night because when a bed is available. It's a very precious resource that may not be available for long, and we have to kind of jump on those. Sounds like a sounds like somebody's almost donating a kidney <laughs> when you, if, you, if you all find a find a an open bed, so that Sometimes. you have to act with that kind of urgency. Gentlemen, thank you for being part of the panel today. I hope we've You're covered welcome. everything that you hope to cover. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Morning Fox from the uh, state of Vermont and George Karabakis from HCRS will join the panel as we uh, close out a call to action mental health. You're listening to 100.3 FM and AM 1490. Thank you.
Welcome back to Brooks Memorial Library and WKBT's Public Forum Call to Action Mental Health. Fish and I moderating panelists as well as members of the public coming in here to have this conversation about the issue of mental health in our community. Actually, a really nice comment I had from somebody I invited who I know works in the school system here, uh, just appreciating some of the people she got to know their names and faces of today. And that is part of the goal here is to connect people who may be working in tandem on an issue and not even being aware of some of the other people working on it, as well as some of the resources available. We're going to talk to a couple of people to close the panel uh, on the umbrella level of different resources and some of the different policies that inform those resources, but we are still making time as well for people uh, who are here in the room with us to get up and, and go to the podium and speak as well. Uh, joining me on the panel is Morning Fox uh, from the Vermont Department of Mental Health. He's the Clinical Services and Operations Director, and then George Karabakakis, the executive director at HCRS who spoke earlier as well and gentlemen you've been here since the beginning of this panel you've heard a lot uh, from a lot of different issues here I'd like to start uh, and George uh, just have you kind of react to what you've been hearing so far yeah. well um, well first of all I'd like to thank you Chris and Peter uh, and WKVT for making this happen because I think this is so important this call to action is so absolutely essential and what we've heard the poignant and powerful stories the sharing of personal stories it just really I think it it can't help but impact all of us to understand the urgency and the challenges that we face as a system and as a system our community mental health designated agency system has not gotten a call well I let me preface that Last year, we got a 0.22% cost of a living increase, two-tenths of 1%. But we have not, as a system, gotten a cost of living increase since 2008. I mean, that's eight years. And costs go up. All our costs go up. So in, in a sense, that is really a cut. And our services, certainly at HCRS, are so much, and I think as we've heard, are so integral and so essential to the fabric of our social services, of our healthcare system. And time and time again, what we hear is that mental health and co-occurring substance abuse issues are cited as one of the top three, if not the number one concern in hospitals and community need health needs assessment, in the ER certainly. So, and, and we, at our agency, at HCRS, we serve about 4,500 children, youth, and individuals, and their families. So we provide a lot of services, but that's, that isn't enough, as we've heard. The prevalence rate for serious mental illness in the state of Vermont is about 17%. That amounts to 5,700 adults in Wyndham County. We serve less than 20% of those adults in all our adult programs. So that means that more than 80% of the folks in our community who have challenges, we are not providing services. We need RAP, Wellness Recovery Action Plan. We need peer supports. We need our community partners to work together. We also know that anxiety, that significant anxiety and depression is reported by 25% of individuals. We also know that suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst teenagers in Vermont. Uh, that is really, that is, I don't even know what to say about that. There's not much you can say. It's unacceptable. Say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yes, we've got youth mental health, mental health first aid. There are things that we are doing to try to, uh, to address that, and yet it is really a challenge. And those numbers, the numbers that make up those statistic, statistics are people's lives. They are persons' lives. They are, each of those numbers is a story. And it's a story that is very powerful. And what we do, and certainly whether it's Kristen or whether it's Knowles or whether it's, you know, other, you know, our peer support services, you know, we're out there to help connect children and families and individuals to all sorts of services because there are a lot of unmet social service needs. We've got folks co-located at hospitals at the police departments. We're working closely. We cannot do our work if we don't do it with partners, whether it's SEVCA, whether it's the P 
police department, whether it's BMH, whether it's, there are so many organizations, Brattleboro Housing Authority, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, Groundworks, we work together because it's the only way we can work as a system if we're going to make a difference in the lives of, of the folks that we serve. But to sort of take it to another level, the world of healthcare is changing at warp speed. And, but there is one thing, as many have said, that does not change, and that is that transforming lives means having a caring relationship. That's where it starts, and that's where it continues. And those genuine moments of human connection, those moments where we, with our own humanity, are sharing that with others, that is what makes a difference. That is the foundation of our work. But the harsh reality is that we don't have the funding. If we don't get cost of living increases, we are going to lose people. We lose people to the state. We lose people to hospitals. We lose people to other agencies that might pay more. We do not get the funding that we need. Our turnover rate at HCRS is 24%. Statewide, it's 27.5%. There are agencies that have turnover rates in the 40s. That, that's not just a number. That means a relationship with someone is lost and it means you have to tell your story all over again. That is the challenge. Now we have choices and the state has choices. And in 1993 when they closed Brandon Training School for people with developmental disabilities who were basically warehoused, institutionalized, they were not in the community. The state made a commitment to community-based care, because this isn't just about, as Peter, as you said, it's not just about folks with mental illness. This is about folks who have developmental disability, other issues where community-based care is where it's at. And so we, I think it's really important that we, we continue to support that, and our voices are really, really critical, because at the heart of all this is supporting and committing to community-based care. And <clears throat> there is a proposal, the House, has passed it and it's going to the Senate to increase Medicaid rates by 2%. That is a good thing. It's a small start. What we're asking for is 3% over the next four years. 2% is a start. It's not all the way, but it's important that we, that we support that. And I, I think our senators need to hear that. Our community needs to hear that. We need to, to put our voice out there because our community needs it, our staff deserve it. And ultimately, we should remember, and I'll go back, a couple of folks said that, that this isn't just about the folks we serve. This isn't just about those. This is about our families, our friends, our neighbors, community members. This is about us. And I'm, that was a meeting, and I, I brought it with me, but one of our, our peer recovery coordinator, Malika, was that we had an annual meeting, and she passed out erasers, and I'm holding a rectangular eraser because this eraser represents erasing the line between us and them. This isn't about, this is about us. They are us. We all are impacted. I know that. I think many people in this room know that. And it's important that we erase that line and realize this is about us as a community. And so. Thank you. Uh, Fox, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, in the context of some of those turnover numbers he was given both here in Wyndham County and then across the state, uh, it sounds to me that you've probably had these similar conversations in other parts of Vermont. Yeah, it's not uncommon to hear uh, what George is, is, is expressing uh, as far as turnover rates uh, at the different agencies. Uh, some of the toughest things that I've been involved with uh, in my just about three years working for the Department of Mental Health is when we all hear, well, the budget is level funded. Uh, you know, the governor says, you know, budget's level funded. Uh, as George said, level funded means cuts, uh, you know, because the cost of services doesn't remain the same. Cost of living uh, for salaries continues, you know, those, those things go up, uh, you know, whether it be gas prices, milk prices, you know, cost of services in general. So when the governor says to us, it's a level funded budget, that's a scary thing because now we sit there in the department looking at all the different budgets around for all the different services throughout the state and what what do you cut what do you save what do you not and we try and taking all that input from stakeholders from advocates from the agencies from the hospitals and trying to make those difficult decisions uh it's not an easy thing um, 
I also want to say, you know, as as much of a of a huge impact that resources, you know, and I think when we talk resources, I think most of us are thinking about fiscal, uh, which helps kind of create those resources, isn't the only piece of, of this puzzle. I'm really very glad to hear uh, pretty much at every point during the panel discussion today, the discussion of stigma uh, and the discussion that, that uh, raising awareness and stigma uh, has such a huge impact. With the closing of the Vermont State Hospital, with the, the uh, deinstitutionalization back you know, from the 60s and 70s, and et cetera, folks with chronic, persistent, severe mental illnesses are in our communities. We, we are us, you know, uh, and, and so, uh, like, like with the Brandon Training School, as George said, kind of folks in the past have been warehoused, if you will, uh, and not in our sight, not, and this has really helped put, put these issues in the spotlight. Uh, and I think only more positive things can come from this, from keeping this in the spotlight as we move forward. So uh, we, I know that George has to, has to leave here shortly to go moderate another meeting, but the one thing I wanted <laughs> to point out, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood this, that uh, organizations like HCRS are fighting for a 3% cost of living increase, and that's just to keep things at a status quo. That's not right. to make any change. That's just hoping you can retain people. That's just hoping mm -hmm. that you can keep everything to stop the bleeding. It will at three percent, which is nothing. I think we can all agree is not enough to do the work that you do. Is just simply putting a tourniquet on the situation mm -hmm. to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So I think what we'll do is we'll take a break. When we come back, we have somebody standing at our podium yeah. who has a, wants to make a statement, ask a question. So we'll take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll have about 10 minutes left in the forum, and um, we'll lean on morning to, to close <laughs> <Yeah>. it out. <laughs> All right, so you're listening to 100.3 FM and AM 1490. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to a call to action on uh, 100.3 FM and AM 1490. Uh, we're going to open up this final segment of the show. Uh, we have a statement, a question. Uh, yeah, well, maybe more of a statement. Okay. Uh, my name's Malika Puffer, um, and I'm a psychiatric survivor, um, and I also manage peer support services at HCRS. Um, and what I mean when I say that I'm a psychiatric survivor is that uh, I feel like I survived this mental health system or psychiatry and largely felt very harmed. Um, not exclusively, but largely. Um, and specifically, have had like literally 12 different diagnoses including like the major ones and been a CRT client. I've been in many hospitals. I've been on like 20 different psych drugs. Um, so those are my credentials. Um, <laughs> well qualified. And, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not trying to speak for um, anyone else who's been in the system, but I think that many people who would identify as psychiatric survivors might agree with some of these things that I'm going to say, um, which is that uh, much that has been said here I agree with and also much that has been said here I really disagree with and actually I'm a bit offended by. Um, and, and I think that it's related to kind of the source of the harmfulness of the system in general, at least in my life and, and I know for many people, which is kind of the ideology of the system. This idea that um, some of, for some of us, our thoughts and feelings and behaviors um, are sick rather than understandable in the context of our lives and our belief systems and our culture and, and family of origin and all of that. Um, that's been a, a pretty harmful idea. And an example um, of how that is applicable here is, you know, many of us have been talking about stigma and the desire for there to be less stigma. And of course, we all want that. Um, but I think largely the approach to stigma reduction that's been used in the Western world has been uh, actually stigmatizing. Um, so there's been some studies done on, on the correlation between the increase in people's buy-in to the biopsychiatric model, this idea that people's thoughts and feelings and behaviors can be understood as simply a result of something abnormal happening in their brain and an illness analogous to cancer or di diabetes. That's been correlated with an increase in uh, stigma and distrust and fearfulness and lack of rapport between clinicians who have that ideology and those um, as opposed to those who don't. Um, so I think that uh, 
for many of us kind of on, on this side of the system um, also feel that there's a big call to action. And I think there's a, a large amount of overlap. And a big part of that overlap is about funding. Um, the call to action that feels important to me is changing some of this ideology, the narrative that people are told to make sense of their, the, the struggles going on in their life. Um, uh, psychiatric drugs, I think, are a huge issue that we need to have more conversation about. I think some really hopeful conversations are happening there. I heard some good things here today about that. Um, less coercion and force being used. Um, and just a different way of relating and being with people. I think those are all calls to action. And most of them require that people are not so stressed out in their jobs that they're just going to the quickest, easiest, force-based approach. It means that people need to have time and space in their jobs to be able to come to trainings and have meaningful philosophical conversations about what we're doing. Uh, people who have maybe experiences like I've had in my life need to be included in these conversations and we need to make space to hear those stories. Um, and, and all of these don't happen so well when uh, we are so strapped as the system is right now. Uh, I mentioned that I manage peer support services for HCRS and that is a program that I think HCRS is doing a really good job and working hard to make happen financially but it's challenging because it's not a revenue producing thing um, and if there could be more space for flexible uh, sorts of services like that I think that would be really good for everyone. Malika, thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments and uh, I'd like to actually get Fox, your reaction when she talked about funding, uh, and obviously more is always better when we're talking about dollars, but it also strikes me that uh, what she was talking about was directing this funding in different places and, and how you can do that from a, a state level to make sure that the, the resources are being allocated in the right ways that can be effective in a situation like she described. Well, most, most of the funding that, that flows through the department to the designated agencies. Uh, the de each designated agency then uh, manages and decides, you know, for, for most intensive purposes, how they're going to manage you know, their, 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 their fiscal situation. They have mandated populations, mandated services uh, through our contracts uh, with them that they have to provide. So there's, you know, certain amount that they know they have to provide this service, they have to provide that service. Um, but we'll work with them, uh, any of the agencies around, trying to be creative and, and working together collaboratively around creative funding, uh, whether it be helping helping to write, you know, grants, uh, grant writing, other other avenues as well. You know, there's other avenues other than just straight uh, Medicaid money or money from the legislature. Uh, and so we try to work with all of our sister agencies as much as possible uh, well, in that sense. What about, uh, I mean, some of the different modalities uh, that she spoke of sure. and, and being open to other ideas and out ideas sure. maybe outside the mainstream. That's something that probably Vermont is a little yeah. bit more accepting of maybe than other states even. Sure, and there's there's a number of uh, different uh, programs, newer programs, programs that have uh, been shown successful in other countries that have been brought uh, here. That uh, things such as uh, open dialogue is one of the uh, types of uh, of, pro of programs that uh, different agencies are are designed to invest in, uh, and so they've decided to allocate some funds from one service or one one area in their in their agency to allocating funds into developing that that type of service or that program. Uh, and we're very supportive of those. We've got roughly two minutes left in the segment. Did you have something quick yeah, you'd like to say? Yeah, just very quickly let people know in regards to funding that the government, our government, voted themselves in a $10,000 a year raise underneath a copy of the budget. And that money right there could be used to fund and probably have extra money left. Yep. That's and all I'm going to say. Nope, that's a, that's a brilliant point to bring up. I guess if we could just, uh, we're going to kind of bring this thing in for a landing. Um, and George, if you could give us a 30 second synopsis of what you, in an ideal world, in a utopic <laughs> mental health world, you would like to see. Uh, how much time did I have? <laughs> <laughs> 27 now seconds. 27 now 27 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Uh, well, we need, we need to be on par with health care, physical health care and mental health care, mind, body, health, spirit, we are one. We have to treat the whole person. And in order to do that, the funding has to follow because in fact, our services drive health care costs. So I think, so 
essentially it is to have the kind of adequate funding that can support the needs of folks in the community. That should include peer support services. That should include alternatives. It should include all the things that we talk about that can help people as early as possible so they don't end up meeting with the chief or Kristen you know, at the police department, that they, that we can support those folks early on and, and really provide the services that, that they need and that our community needs in the community. All right, so we're going to go over our scheduled time because, uh, Maureen, I want to ask you that same question. Um, my utopic ideal world. Uh, better integration. Uh, healthcare integration uh, moving forward. Uh, primary care, physician, mental health care, uh, integrating services, uh, uh, developing uh, more avenues for ease of access to services um, and, uh, uh, and prevention and intervention early and often. Uh, I think you know we've we've had a few discussions, a few mentions of children, youth, and family here today, but uh, not enough focus necessarily because uh, the earlier prevention that we can provide can help reduce uh, a lot of the things going on for folks as they they go into the adult world, uh, and maybe can even avoid folks entering into the adult system of care, if you will. Thank you. So that is all the time that we have today for our forum. Hopefully we've all walked away with a little bit more knowledge. Um, a call to action, if you will. We now know the people that we need to call. We now know the issues <laughs> that are concerned. I know I've learned a lot today. Yeah. I really have. I've never thought about uh, the, the fact of getting rid of stigma being stigmatizing. I never even, mm -hmm. never even thought about it. So thank you for that. Um, and um, I guess uh, it's it's not our intention for this to be the end of the conversation, obviously, but just the beginning. Uh, we thank everybody for coming today to be on the panel, as well as you out here in the audience. We thank uh, the Works Bakery for providing refreshments for this. We thank Brooks Memorial Library for hoping for hosting. Uh, this forum. We thank Brattleboro Community Television for taping it. Uh, visit their website, brattleborotv.org. They'll let you know when it's going to be broadcast as well as be available to watch on their website. And thanks to my co-moderator, Fish, uh, for putting this whole thing together. Uh, this is WKVT 100.3 FM and AM 1490, and we now return to our regularly scheduled programming. Scheduled programming.